Manager Ali Marmol said something on Sunday that hinted at some clubhouse issues this season. We're going to talk about it and more today on Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinals fans. I'm J.D. Haffern, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou and a lifetime Cardinals fan, and I'm your host for Locked On Cardinals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter at J.D. Sports Radio. You can follow me and the podcast as well at LO underscore Cardinals. I want to thank those of you who make Locked On Cardinals your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. If you have not joined us there yet, I'm telling you, it's worth it. Come on by the YouTube page, like, subscribe, comment. You get to see a, a visual version of the show, which is, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's its just as good. I know sometimes you're in the car and you're got to listen to it on the podcast version, and that's fine, or you're at the gym. But if you're around a computer or you're around a screen where you can see what's going on, why not check us out? Got the ugly shirt on again today because, you know what, we did wrap up the weekend uh, with a win over the Cincinnati Reds. And it'll be the last time that you see this shirt probably for quite some time, at least until next season, uh, till we get things going. But um, yeah, if you haven't gone to YouTube yet, make sure you do that. Hit that notification button so you know when the new episodes are posted. This show right here, serving Cardinal Nation, giving the fans all of the info about the birds on the bat. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On MLB for twenty bucks off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, uh, it's over. It is over. Mercifully, the Cardinals' twenty twenty three season has come to an end after taking two of three against the Cincinnati Reds. They got bombed on Friday night, nineteen runs against them. I thought the Reds were going to break the record for most home runs in a game. They give up six in that one. Um, the record's 10, by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, but they end up coming back and giving them a taste of their own medicine on Saturday. Then they get the win on Sunday, finish up the regular season at 71 and 91. It's their first 90 loss season since 1990. And they missed the playoffs for the first time since 2018. And I'm a pretty positive guy. At least the guys in it on a good note, right? They beat the Reds Saturday and Sunday. You had the Adam Wainwright festivities going on all weekend long. You got to see him swing the bat, not once, but twice. Two at-bats for Adam Wainwright on the weekend. Um, he did his concert on Saturday, which went over really, really well. Uh, that was after the game. Pretty cool setup that they had there. Had him in uh, center field, which, which was nice. I thought they would get him uh, over there by home plate, but I, I forgot. You got to kind of work on the field after the game. So uh, center field, kind of neat that he was out there for that. You get the surprise of seeing Yadier Molina and Albert Pujols coming back on Sunday. Uh, Chris Carpenter also in attendance for that, that wonderful pregame ceremony on Sunday. Um, you had other legends rocking their their fancy red jackets. Uh, the crowd got to boo John Mosellock a couple of times, and you've got to admit. So John goes up onto the mic at one point. They boo him, and he ends up having a pretty funny response, saying, "I thought you were saying Newt Bar," and people chuckled. I mean, come on. At least he tried to make a light of the whole situation. He knows why he's getting booed. Um, you had all the gifts. You had the speeches. And it just kind of put everybody into a, a really good mood. And then you wrap up the day with that win on Sunday. And uh, it kind of helped many of us forget how terrible the season was, at least, you know, for a little bit. So I thought the Cardinals did an excellent job. I was there many, many moons ago when Ozzie Smith had his retirement ceremony. He was my favorite player growing up. So uh, I got to see that. And that was really cool. And uh, watching this one on TV, it was really nice as well. They, they did a great job. What are you going to do? But we all know that you can't polish a turd, right? Let's get back to reality really quick. After all the all the, the happiness and the hugs and the crying and everything, that went, let's not forget how bad this season was. A big, juicy, fat turd. And it's now got to be flushed. It's got to be flushed. But at the same time, I don't want to completely forget it. But 
I want you to learn from it. Learn from it so it doesn't stink up Bush Stadium again in 2024. So many questions. Will this front office learn from its mistakes? Will the players? Will the coaches? Who are they going to get to make this team better for next year? How much money are they going to spend? Should we trust whatever this new philosophy is going to be moving forward, considering how bad they all failed this year? These are just a few of the questions that we will try to answer over the next few months during this offseason. In case you're wondering, we don't go anywhere. There, there's no offseason, really. Now, there might be a point later on in the early months of 2024 where there's not a whole lot of things going on baseball-wise where we might cut down on episodes from, I don't know, like five, you know, Monday through Friday to just three a week. That That could happen at some point. But... For the most part, we're right here with you the entire time. I'm going to be right here with you the entire time. It's going to be an offseason that will be unlike any that we've dealt with in St. Louis for quite some time because they don't lose like this. It's not normal. And I got to point out because the Cardinals aren't the only team going through this. There, there are other teams who had much larger payrolls had playoff aspirations that, that didn't quite work out for them as well. So um, we're going to get that into, into that later on in today's episode. You know, the Padres, the Yankees, uh, the Mets, their failures, at least in my eyes, way worse than what happened to the Cardinals, considering that they were the three highest payrolls in the league when the season started. And they're just like us. They're on the outside looking in at this year's postseason. So we'll get into that later on in segment three, but there were a lot of issues for this Cardinals team this year. We know this performance being a big part of it. A lot of people didn't live up to expectations. Health was another major hurdle. A lot of injured guys again this year, which seems like it just seems like the Cardinals have dealt with a lot of injuries in recent years. And it always, it, it wasn't always like this, but for some reason they've got a lot of dudes who just cannot stay healthy on this team. But what about clubhouse chemistry? That was something that we didn't really feel like was much of a problem this year, but maybe there was something going on behind the scenes that perhaps we weren't fully aware of out there, out there. You know, um, the reason I say this is because Ali Marmel said something that I, I found extremely interesting on Sunday. STLtoday.com's Derek Gould asked him what the first step is in getting ready to compete in 2024. And Ali's response was, quote, I want a clubhouse full of guys that has one thing on their minds and it's not themselves. It's winning a championship. So you start out by weeding those out. Whoa. Whoa. Now that to me signals that there, there were some folks in that clubhouse who weren't exactly gung ho about doing what it was that Ali wanted them to do what he deemed best for the team and instead decided it was best to look out for their own personal well-being. That's what that quote says to me. Now, Ali did not expand on this particular statement, decided not to. He was like, nah, not going to go any further than that. So it left a lot of us wondering, who the hell is he talking about, right? So what I did, I combed the roster from this year, tried to make a couple of educated guesses on who might be the culprits in this particular case? Now, when I tweeted this out, I actually got a response from our guy Sam over at Locked on Cubs who immediately put Wilson Contreras. And I was kind of taken back by this because I didn't really get the feeling that Wilson Contreras was any way thinking about himself at all this season. Like, I just, I, it didn't, I didn't think that way. Um, but when I asked him if that was like the case in Chicago, was that a problem before he said at the end of his tenure there, it was, which part of me understands why he might be that way a little bit in the final months in Chicago, you know, um, they, they weren't resigning him. He knew that much. They didn't trade him. That became an issue too, because they, you know, remember, remember it was like the, he was doing the hugs with, uh, Ian Happ. Last day at Wrigley, and then he didn't get traded. And then he was just kind of stuck there, all awkward, being someplace that he didn't think they wanted him anymore and where he, I guess, didn't want to be anymore any anyways. 
you know, why shouldn't he look out for himself going into free agency and take care of himself? Not a great look still. You know, I don't want to hear that about a guy. You know, you want a guy to go out on that field and compete 110% day in, day out, no matter what the circumstances may be. It clearly didn't bother the Cardinals. The Cardinals knew that had to have gone on, and uh, they signed him to that five-year deal. Anywho, they clearly didn't know that he wasn't out that great of a catcher either uh, coming into this. And early on in the season, we, you know, we had that issue where Willie was not calling the greatest of games. There was the rumor that he was calling for pitches that guys didn't even throw. Pitchers didn't want to pitch to him anymore. So maybe there was a bit of, I'm doing this my way going on there at the beginning. I can't say I know that for sure. But on the other side of it, he did skip the World Baseball Classic so he could go to spring training and be in camp with all of his new teammates and the new coaches. So it doesn't really strike me as something a selfish player would do. Why would he do that if he was that guy? Wouldn't he go to the World Baseball Classic and then show up after that was done and say, okay, now I'm here. I'll figure it all out. I'm already a genius anyway, so why wouldn't I just keep doing things my way? But even if that was the case, things seemed to get ironed out fairly quickly, even if that was what was going on. Uh, he was back behind the plate after, what, a few games? And we didn't hear about really any other issues the rest of the way. In fact, Willie became a fan favorite for you know the grit and the attitude that he showed on the field, his willingness to play through a ton of injuries. Remember when he got cracked on the head? It was bleeding and tried to stay in the game. They're like, no, 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 dude. We got to... We got to talk concussions with you. What are you talking about? He tried. Had a great performance at the plate this year. After things got settled down a little bit, dude was awesome hitting wise. Um, we all know that Adam Wainwright's one of the nicest guys on the planet, but he genuinely seemed happy that it was Wilson Contreras behind the plate catching win number 200 for him. I mean, did he strike you as someone more interested in himself than the team this year? I, I didn't see it, but maybe you saw something I didn't. So let me know in the comments down below or hit me up on Twitter and uh, we can discuss it. Um, now, one name was brought up in the responses to my tweet more than than any other name. Uh, so we're going to talk about him. I got two other guys I want to bring up, guys that uh, Ali might be referring to. We'll do that next here on Locked on Cardinals. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, the music, comedy, and theater near you. Cardinals aren't in the playoffs, but if you want to go check out a playoff game, game time's got tickets for that. NFL in full swing now, college football. We've got we got the Blues. We got the Blues firing it up. Uh, they're in exhibition games. They lost to the Blue Jackets tonight, which is kind of a bummer because I know some Columbus fans, but uh Game time. It's got your hookup on tickets to all of these events with great deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting excited for the fun that you're about to have. You don't have to uh, plan in months in advance either. Game time's got deals on those tickets right up to the day of the event. Exclusive flash deals on tickets for all the sports, the comedy, the theater, the concerts. They got you covered. They've also got the game time guarantee, it means you'll always get the best price. And if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game time will take care of that. They'll credit you 110% of the difference sent directly to your phone. Get the tickets without the stress. You can do it with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code locked on MLB for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you again for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen every day. You can leave comments on YouTube as well as on Twitter anytime you want, 24-7. Your feedback, always welcome and encouraged. I, I, I want you to be involved with this podcast. I'm going to need you this offseason, man. We got a lot of stuff to get through before next year gets going. Like, there's going to be a lot of changes. And uh, changes is something Ali Marmel was talking about here in this article with Derek Gold. Weeding out guys who are more interested in themselves than a championship is the quote we're going off of here. So um, I'm going to cross Contreras off the list, okay? I don't think he was a part of the problem. And if he was, they, they can't weed him out anyway because he's got four more years on this contract. But I don't think he is. I I, I, I enjoyed having Willie on the team this year. I feel like Willie got, uh, got situated 
things were fine the rest of the way after May. You know, that's when he started to look and act himself. So um, I could be wrong. But here are three other names I would consider. Um, a couple of them actually already jettisoned off the team. We're going to start here with uh, Henesis Cabrera. Now, Henesis Cabrera, we know he's had a few issues here and there. Spiked the ball incident last year when Ali came out to pull him out of the game and was mad at himself, was mad that he was getting pulled and spiked the ball on the mound. Not a great look. Um, and this year, things just never quite felt right with Cabby, who was apparently disgruntled about not being used in higher leverage situations. You want to know how you get used in higher leverage situations? Be good. Pitch well. And you would see Cabby for a few games do really, really well, and then he'd get hammered. And then he pitched well for a couple. And then he get hammered. A lot of guys had that problem this year, but nobody else got teed off about it when they were struggling and not getting used in bigger situations. We know the guy's got talent. He's been great since getting shipped over to Toronto. But remember this. The Cardinals were starving for pitching this year, starting rotation and bullpen. A team that's like that doesn't normally DFA a 26-year-old left-hander who throws upper 90s and is making peanuts, making less than a million dollars this year, unless there was something more going on. So, Henesis Cabrera, I think, was one of the guys that he was discussed or talking about here. He doesn't name him, like I said, but he's one of them. But they got rid of him. He was gone. Got him for some catcher that... Toronto took in the 14th round or so, just for nothing, basically. The next guy, the one name that was tweeted back to me in response to this story more than anybody else is out. I hate this. I hate it, but I understand. Tyler O'Neill. Tyler Broneal. Oh, man. You know, there was a bad vibe ever since the early season game against Atlanta, right? where O'Neill didn't appear to be running at full speed around third base, got thrown out at home. Ollie called him out in the post game. Tyler didn't seem to like that when he found out about it. And it just felt like there might be some tension between Tyler and Ollie for the rest of the year. Like Tyler didn't trust Ollie. Ollie wasn't all impressed with Tyler's ability to stay out on the field. You know, we never heard much more about it later on. O'Neill hurt most of the year anyway, so it's not like we had a lot of chances to to hear any conversations about him. But, you know, some people online have accused Tyler of being soft. I'm one of those guys. Like, the dude's always hurt. And I don't know how severely he's hurt. The back issue and stuff, I mean, it kept him out for a long time, so I'm assuming it was something very, very painful. But a lot of times he misses games for what, some people would deem are minor issues, but we never really heard Ali saying anything like that. Nobody said, you know, well, there's some guys who just aren't tough enough. Or you never heard that. But a lot of people seem to think that Tyler O'Neill is one of the guys he was talking about in this situation from that quote. Again, he did not name any names. So we're just guessing here. And I'm not trying to call Tyler O'Neill out on this. I, I wish Tyler O'Neill could stay healthy and bring all the joy that he brought to us in 2021 because he was so much fun to watch. He's great on defense. He's got power. He's got speed. But we never get to see it anymore because he's always hurt. And it's really, really a bummer. You know, injuries are a big part of a lot of this. Um, another name, and this is going to be one of those that uh, has already been shipped away, but might be one of the guys, Jack Flaherty. Jack Flaherty. That's another name that comes to mind. Baltimore Orioles pitcher Jack Flaherty now, but here's the thing. I don't know Jack Flaherty personally. And I'm not and I'm not going to base this off of anything he's ever said about anything other than baseball. Whatever he gets into politics wise and whatever he tweets, I don't care. I, I'm I'm talking purely baseball here. When he's on the mound. There is just this aura about him that rubs people the wrong way, whether it's facial expressions, body language. He just never really appears to be all that enthusiastic about being out there on the mound. There have been plenty of pitchers over the years that 
have an ice cold demeanor when they're when they're on the mound, when they're towing that rubber, just no emotion. Remember, Chris Carpenter, one of my favorite Cardinal pitchers of all time. I still rock his jersey when I go to games. Had that assassin's look on the mound in his prime. I never saw Nolan Ryan smile ever until after a game. Dave Stewart with the Oakland A's. Remember that stare that he had? I mean, just very intimidating. But Jax isn't, Jack's demeanor doesn't always seem focused and intimidating. It, it looks more of like, eh, crap happens. Kind of a feel to it. And, and if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. I, I can't be the only one that gets this vibe, am I? I mean, remember this picture? If you're watching on YouTube, remember this picture? Standing next to Willie after they blew the lead. The bullpen comes in. They blow the lead, and there's Jack standing next to Willie McGee. That visual right there, that's the vibe I get off of Jack Flaherty when he's on the mound, even when he's doing good. They weren't always bad starts. And I'm not saying he doesn't care or that he's not focused. The dude, when healthy, has been one of the better pitches the Cardinals have had in recent years. But a lot of people I talk to just don't like him. And I, I it's whatever. The, I, the word douche gets brought up a lot. <laughs> That's how they feel about him. Is he one of the guys? Maybe. Maybe he was, but he's no longer with the team anyway. So I don't really have to worry about him anymore. Uh, in that same article, one of the things Gould mentions is what Adam Wainwright's final message to the team in the clubhouse was. And um, he said this, quote, brand on the front is more important than the name on the back. He referenced legacies and lessons passed down from Cardinal to Cardinal, from Bob Gibson to Bob Forrest, to Chris Carpenter, to him, as is the way. That message is likely meant not only for all of those younger guys that were in the clubhouse at the end of the year, the guys who will carry the brand forward, like Jordan Walker, Mason Wynn, and others. Lars Nupar, I feel like, is uh, a major part of this. But perhaps it was a reminder for some of the veterans who will still be around now that he's gone. You know, new leaders like uh, Miles Michaelis. He's going to be the leader of the staff now. He's the veteran guy. 35 years old. It's it's on him now to take these young guys under his wing and be the new Wayno for uh, for them in the clubhouse during bullpen sessions at spring training. He's going to have to take on this responsibility. And whether you like Ollie or not, whether you think he's a good manager or not, he seems, at least from the quotes that I've read after the season has ended, he seems to have the right attitude coming out of this crappy season going into 2024. Told Gold that when he saw the lines of people waiting to get into the stadium on Sunday for the, the ceremony with Wainwright, said that uh, it just reminds you, fix it. Like the city deserves a really good product on that field. And it was a reminder of making sure that there is a big responsibility and we cannot repeat what happened this year. They are deserving of a lot more. The fact that they continue to show up and still support this club means a lot. Now it's on us to make it right. He talked about how the Cardinals should, the fans should be pissed and they should be upset at everybody, himself, front office, players. There's no excuse for a season like this to ever happen in St. Louis. Adam Wainwright chimed in with a, a positive lookout on the clubhouse for, uh, you know, next year for the team moving forward with Adam saying the house doesn't fall. If the bones are good, there are some real good bones in there. There are some real good leaders. There are some real good players in there. I think the town is hungry. I think the front office is hungry. Our owner is hungry to flip the script from 91 losses. That is not who we are. We are not a 91 loss team. We've not played this style of baseball since I've been here. We brought it on ourselves. We didn't perform. We didn't pitch well like we needed to. Those guys in the clubhouse are hungry too. They want to flip that script also. They are going to be some tenacious Cardinals in the clubhouse next year. Now, one way to try to turn this whole thing around, because it's going to be a large task, 
It's going to take a lot of not only people who are already in this organization to step their game up, but it's going to take some outside pieces to come in and help fill those holes and fix these problems. One way to bring people in is by throwing money at the problem. And this year, we've kind of learned that spending the most doesn't always mean that you're going to be a winner. And we're going to dive into that next here on Locked on Cardinals. So the Cardinals aren't the only team wrapping up a disappointing regular season. You know, other teams with much larger payrolls had playoff aspirations and fell flat on their faces too. We're not the only ones. Uh, we had a locked on MLB meeting uh, earlier today. And one word that was brought up to describe this season from a lot of the hosts was weird. What a weird year it was that, you know, there were some teams making major leaps forward. Some much earlier than expected. Uh, the Orioles come to mind. Orioles, I thought this year were going to take a step forward, that they were going to be better. I did not see 101 wins coming out of Baltimore this year. They won 83 last year. They were on the right path. I thought it was going to take one more year before all of the young guys came up and were able to contribute, but they surprised me in a lot of teams. 101 wins this year. Uh, the Marlins, led by Skip Schumacher, go from 69 to 84 wins. Arizona, from 74 to 84. I thought they were another year away. Uh, the Reds, 62 to 82 wins, a 20-win bump. I thought they were at least one year away, maybe two. And they had like five rookies just go crazy for them this year. Pittsburgh, 62 to 76 wins. The Texas Rangers, I think we all thought they were going to be good, but they went from 68 to 90, and they did it in large part without any help from Jacob deGrom, who, guess what, got hurt. Um, Detroit, 66 to 78 wins. And when that many teams go up, it means a lot of other teams had to come down and crashing down like the Cardinals did. So um, teams like the Padres, the Yankees, and the Mets, like I said earlier, I feel like they're not making the playoffs was a worst scenario or worst situation than what the Cardinals are going through because of how high their payrolls were. Those are the three highest payrolls in baseball this year. Mets, Yankees, Padres. No playoffs. You know, spending a buttload of money doesn't always solve the problem. There are some teams who were able to spend a lot of money and are doing it well, and it's working out. You got the Phillies, uh, Dodgers, Blue Jays, Braves, all over $200 million at the beginning of this year. They've built very good teams with that money. The Rangers were just short 195 when the year started. Houston at 192. Things have worked out well for them. And I'll admit this offseason, I really wanted the Cardinals to spend some extra money to go get another pitcher and another bat, specifically one of those free agent shortstops. That, that's what I wanted. In large part, it got in my head that they were going to do something like that because Mo said they were going to spend more money, which I took my bad for assuming, was going to be a significant bump in payroll to improve what was already a 93-win team in, 2000, um, in 2022 and get them over the hump after getting swept by Philly. I thought that would teach them to say, oh, gosh, we were this close. Let's go do a couple moves here. They're going to be big ones, but it'll get us over that hump. And I was wrong. They didn't do anything. They got Contreras because they had to but they didn't make those significant additions like I thought they were to the pitching staff, perhaps even at shortstop. They were rumored <laughs> to do it, but it never happened. Now, the two guys I wanted, one of them would have been a major mistake. The other one ended up working out okay. I wanted Carlos Rodon and Trey Turner. Those were my choices. I didn't really think Trey Turner was really going to happen. I, I didn't think they really had a good shot at him. I don't think they were, to, they were willing to pay what anybody else would for Trey Turner, but gosh, wouldn't he have been something at the top of this lineup? What do you do with Mason Wynn now when you're looking at it in hindsight? I, I, I don't know, but I thought they were going to, I thought that was something. And then we heard the Dansby Swanson rumors. I'm like, well, maybe that could be good. Uh, but that never happened. The Rodon deal though, I really thought they had a chance at him and 
Now I'm glad they didn't, right? You know, sometimes the 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 best money you spend is the one is the money you don't spend. <laughs> and uh Rodon was an absolute bust this season. Hurt for most of the year. Then he finally comes back and then he wasn't very good anyway. Three and eight, six point eight five ERA this season, made twenty two point eight million dollars, and will make twenty seven point eight million per over the next five years. Is he gonna be healthy? Oh he ain't getting any younger. Can you imagine if the Cardinals had signed him and this is what they got in return? Ooh. Trey Turner, really rough start to the year, but went bonkers in the end. Final two months, incredible. Finishes the season hitting 266, 26 bombs, 76 RBIs, 30 stolen bases, 102 runs scored. Like the numbers are there. I mean, 266 isn't what you thought he'd hit, but everything else pretty, pretty on par for what he does. Uh, the Mets had an opening day payroll over. $353 million. You guys remember this? Record setting number. Spent all that money. Max Scherzer, age 38. Justin Verlander, age 40. Both of them making $43 million this year. Just throwing money at the problem. Francisco Lindor, $34 million. Earned that probably. I don't know, 34 is a lot. Uh, but still, he was pretty good. Robinson Cano at age 40, making $20 million. What? Starling Marte, 20 million. Brandon Nimmo, 18.5. Carlos Carrasco, 14 million. Jose Quintana, 13 million. Mark Canna, 10 million. They finished with 74 wins. $353 million. 74 wins. The Padres, mind boggling, right? All the talent in the world. Still can't figure out why they're not good. I don't know. Blake Snell might win a second Cy Young Award with them. You Darvish was good. Joe Musgrove, not bad. Michael Waka, great signing, outstanding signing. Josh Hader gets everybody out but Tommy Edmond, apparently. They signed Xander Bogarts to that ridiculous deal. Juan Soto, Manny Machado, Tatis Jr. Tatis Jr. comes back. Just under $250 million in payroll, not in the playoffs. The Yankees, they re-sign Aaron Judge, $40 million a year. I mean, you kind of have to. Was hurt again, but still cracked 37 bombs uh, in 106 games. Giancarlo Stanton, always an injury risk, make made $32 million this year, hit 191. 191. Carlos Rodon signing, obviously. We talked about that. DJ LeMahieu, $15 million to hit 243. Josh Donaldson, now with Milwaukee, making $21 million this year. Aaron Hicks, now with Baltimore. 10.5 million. Anthony Rizzo made 17 million. Only got to play 99 games because of injuries, dealing with concussion stuff right now. But was hitting 244 with 12 home runs with that short porch in right field. 12. And you had other teams whose payrolls were above the Cardinals as well, who didn't make it. Angels, obviously, big problems there. The Giants, the Cubs, the Red Sox, the White Sox. My point bringing all of this up is that. Just throwing gobs of money at the problem at different players isn't always the right solution. The uh, Cardinals, according to, is it Spot Track or Spot Rack? I don't know how they say it, but either way, great tool, by the way, if you don't go to their website. Uh, they were around $175 million this year after trades, retirements, free agency, and before any arbitration numbers yet. They're set at about $107 million committed. For next year's active total payroll with tax allocations, got them in at around 123. Let's say 20 million goes to the players who are arbitration eligible. So you're looking at 143. They're at 175 this year. Do the Cardinals need to spend near $250 million to compete next year? No, no, I don't think that's the right thing to do. But I am thinking they need to be closer to 200 million than 175 if they're going to go sign the talent that is needed to swing this thing around quickly, as we all hope they will do. So we'll find out. Uh, in that Derek Gould article today, he brought up two names, Aaron Nola from the Phillies and Sonny Gray from the Twins. My guy, the guy I want. Um, they, those are targets of the Cardinals. Of course they are. There's going to be a long list of people that are chasing. Will they do enough to get it done? We'll see. We'll see. I don't know what the, the full plan is going to be, what any of the late season 
games that some of these pitchers pulled off, you know, the, the Zach Thompson, Dakota Hudson's drew Roms, like what their situation is going to be, how they view them going forward for next year. I don't know. We don't know. And we won't really know much until after the world series is over and free agency begins. So we'll be here the entire time along the way. So thank you again for making locked on Cardinals. Your first listen every day. If you haven't already, give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Cardinals and at JD Sports Radio. Like, subscribe on YouTube, help our channel and love for the Cardinals grow. Again, apologies for this coming out so late on Monday, now going into Tuesday. Um, normal job takes precedence sometimes before I can put this thing out. So at least we're out there now. So let me know all your comments, your suggestions, anything you got for me. Hit me up, YouTube and Twitter. You're the best fans of baseball for a reason. I will see you next time. Unlocked on Cardinals.